Good evening, friends, and happy Navratra from the team of Beyond Law CLC and all those participants who are watching us live on the YouTube and on this platform. After a lot of endeavor, ultimately from the busy schedule, we have been able to, what we say, chip in Mr. K.G. Dagwan, a senior advocate, who not only speaks well on the aspects of law, but beyond that. And before coming live on this YouTube, I was requesting him that we should all understand how one can pay back to the society. Be that as it may, today, Beyond Law CLC and Trikram and Associates are taking an important facet of law, that is art of appellate advocacy, the oral submissions. Because as a lawyer or one who is connected with law always watches that sometimes one is very good at drafting, but is not able to hammer the point, and especially when it is an appellate work. How to funnel down the arguments, how to make the point crisp and clear to the appellate authority, appellate author advocate seat, is an art which we can learn only from the persons who have created the niche within the society. And Mr. Raghavan is one such lawyer and learning from they say the law is only on two aspects. Observing somebody and absorption of some the aspects which we can learn. So it's not only by reading, but also if you learn from the persons of immense knowledge and stature like Mr. Raghavan, it will always be a treat. Without taking much time, I request Mr. Raghavan to share his insights on this important aspect of law. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Vikas. And I'm extremely grateful to you for having given me this opportunity of sharing my thoughts on a very important aspect of advocacy. We all know that advocacy as a concept has several facets. The art of advocacy, especially oral advocacy before the trial court is different from the advocacy that one should adopt in the appellate court. And if the appellate court is not the high court, but another, some other court, the art of advocacy should be different when we are doing a second appeal before the high court. And of course, that art of advocacy will definitely change when we have to argue an appeal before the Supreme Court. Today, as you all know, we are in an era of tribunalization. Not all disputes come before civil courts. And in fact, in most of the statutes, you have a bar against civil courts exercising jurisdiction. Under those special statutes where tribunals exercise jurisdiction, Appeals are provided to appellate tribunals. And in many cases, from the appellate tribunal, there is a direct appeal to the Honorable Supreme Court. In such cases, the art of advocacy would be very different. We will deal with each of them as we go on. And we will see what is the requirement in law insofar as these appeals are concerned, we will also notice how we will have to structure our oral advocacy to bring it within the four corners of the written book. As you're aware, we have appeals from original orders or decrees. They could be first appeals, they could be second appeals, there could be appeals against orders under order 47. And we then have appeal to the Supreme Court. The principal legislation that one has to look at for the purpose of understanding the scope of an appeal, because it is important to do so, as we need to structure our oral submissions to come within the four corners of the law. The principal legislation which provides for appeals against orders that are passed by civil courts is of course the Code of Civil Procedure. And you know that an appeal is provided under section 96 of the CPC. 
against every decree that is passed by a civil court an appeal lies under section 96 with only one exception namely that an appeal does not lie against a consent decree the if the consent has been obtained by fraud or in a manner which is irregular then the remedy is to apply to the same court to say that the consent was obtained wrongly therefore please recall the consent order an appeal does not lie in that situation and if of course the court does not allow the withdrawal of the consent for any reason then an appeal will lie against that order by which the consent has not been permitted to be withdrawn maybe it is vitiated by fraud maybe it is vitiated by misrepresentation or undue influence or whatever be that as it may the first provision that we need to look at is section 96 section 96 has to be read along with order 41 before we structure our oral arguments in an appeal it is necessary to ensure that the appeal is framed in a manner which is acceptable under the provisions of order 41 of the code of civil procedure an appeal should set out the appeal memo or the appeal memorandum as it is called should set out the grounds of appeal in a precise and concise manner and of course the law requires that it should be consecutive in number those are all matters of detail but what is important is that the ground of appeal must be exhausted while it should be concise and need not necessarily be descriptive but it should cover every point that a counsel would require to argue attacking the correctness of the judgment or decree now if a ground is not taken then there is a provision under order 41 to amend the appeal memo seeking leave of the court to add additional grounds if additional grounds are allowed then you can address an argument on the additional grounds of course the court can always look at additional grounds even though it has not been raised in the appeal grounds of the only rider is that the court should give an opportunity to the parties to address on that ground while this is the requirement of an appeal which we shall refer to as a first appeal how do i structure my argument in a first appeal as you are aware first appeal is an appeal both on questions of fact and law whatever the trial court could have looked into or looked into but did not appreciate it properly are all questions which can be raised over again before the high court or the appellate court as the case may be and there and when we are looking at arguing an appeal before the appellate court arising out of a decree passed in a original proceeding it is extremely important that as lawyers we acquaint ourselves thoroughly with the evidence on record both oral and documentary of course you cannot improve on oral evidence in a appeal but you have to then seek leave of the appellate court to produce additional evidence which we shall discuss separately once we have our appeal grounds set out and placed before the court it is important that the counsel arguing the appeal should be fully familiar with all the documents and the evidence on record for the reason that the appellate court is entitled to go into every question of fact and law in a first appeal therefore if we are attacking or challenging 
a decree that is passed by a judgment and decree that is passed by a trial court on a question of fact it is important that we highlight before the court which aspect of the evidence be it oral or documentary we which according to us has not been properly appreciated or not appreciated the in a while conducting the trial you never know how the case will look at the end of it therefore it is invariably a position where when we are cross examining a witness in the trial court we do gather evidence which in the ultimate analysis may be not be relevant at all therefore at the appellate stage if we find that some evidence that has been collected is not relevant i think as counsel it is our duty to simply ignore that evidence and only place that evidence which we think is relevant before the appellate court so that the appellate court is able to focus its attention on the points in issue instead of arguing every matter before the appellate court for example there may be certain issues which we think have been correctly decided by the trial court and therefore it serves no purpose in arguing that particular point before the appellate court and wasting the time of the appellate court because if we do that what happens is by the time we come to the important point in the case the appellate court would have lost its patience and the attention that the appellate court will pay to the important issues will be reduced hence we have to identify which is the most important point that you want to argue in the appellate court as lawyers we need to marshal those points and then say this is the first point i'm going to argue this is the second point i'm going to argue in order of its importance or priority and also allocate in our own mind how much time we want to take on each point because in way we have found that if we advance long and protracted arguments before the appellate court on every aspect of the matter as is done in trial it is very probable that the appellate court will lose its patience and will not apply its mind to the important aspects of the case hence the first rule of advocacy in appellate court is for the lawyer to marshal the points and after having marshaled the points in terms of priority it is then necessary to say in respect of point number 1 what is the oral evidence who are the witnesses who have spoken with respect to this particular point what are the documents available in on record what is the law on the point once we put all this in place on a sheet of paper and then say this is the point i am going to place before the appellate court you will find that the appellate court will be very receptive to what you would say and it is a good practice in my view to prepare a small short note for the benefit of the appellate court point wise and hand it over to the court as you are arguing a particular point in an appeal it is worthwhile to hand over to the appellate court judge a your argument in brief as a synopsis referring to the relevant page number the witness and the paragraph of the deposition which you think is relevant and the exhibit numbers which you think the court must see if this is done it will be very useful to ensure that the appellate court is with you when you are arguing otherwise it is likely that the appellate court will miss the point now one other important aspect that one must notice when you are arguing an appeal before the appellate court 
is this. It is true that in appended port we file voluminous paper box which contains the plain, the written statement, rejoined if any, oral evidence, documentary evidence, all that. In many cases, a large part of that evidence may not be at all relevant for the purpose of the appeal. Therefore, it is a convenient practice as part of advocacy to prepare what may be called as a convenience volume and file that before the court and then refer to the convenience volume instead of troubling the appellate court to go through the voluminous records of the trial. This is a very important aspect of oral advocacy in appellate courts because once we have this convenience volume, it becomes quick and easy for reference. Now, having pointed out what a lawyer must do while preparing a case for argument in an appellate court, it is important to notice a few provisions of the Code of Civil Procedure with regard to appeals from original decrees and judgments. As I indicated, section 96 is the principal point. And then we have another important provision which we should keep in mind while we are arguing an appeal before the appellate court. You are aware that in many cases, decision of the case is made at two stages. One is called the preliminary decree, the other is called as a final decree. What you can do when you are arguing an appeal against a preliminary decree, you cannot do when you are arguing an appeal against a final decree. If the preliminary decree has not been confirmed or has not been appealed against or the preliminary decree has been confirmed. This distinction has to be kept in mind by the lawyer arguing an appeal against a final decree before the appellate court. Now, there is another interesting situation. We all are aware that in the high court, appeals sometimes are heard by a bench comprising of two or more judges. Suppose in a given case, the two judges do not concur with each other or the, or let us assume there are three judges, the three of them do not concur and there is two against one. No problem, if it's two against one, the majority prevail. But where, it, where we have two judges, which is normally the case, the, the, Law is that unless both the judges concur to vary or reverse the decree, the decree is deemed to have been confirmed. That is what flows out of section 98 of the Code of Civil Procedure. Now, in an appeal, we have to keep one important aspect in mind. In a suit filed by A, against B, let us assume that the suit is dismissed. There are two issues that are raised. One is a question of limitation and the other is on the merits of the case. The court may hold against the defendant on the question of limitation, namely that the suit is within time but hold against the plaintiff on the merits of the case. Therefore, the plaintiff's suit has failed. In such a situation, the plaintiff files an appeal. What is important for us to know is that in such an appeal, the respondent defendant can argue that the finding recorded by the trial court on the question of limitation in favor of the plaintiff is wrong and therefore even if the finding on the merits is held to be wrong and therefore in favor of the plaintiff, the final 
decision in the case namely dispersal resort should stand in other words a respondent in an appeal is entitled to contend before the appellate court that a decision on a particular issue which is against him is wrong even though the final order is in his favor this is a very important aspect of appellate advocacy therefore when we are looking at an appeal where some findings are in favor of the appellant and some are against the respondent and you have a brief for the respondent as a lawyer you should not rest content with saying i will simply argue for confirmation of the finding recorded against the appellant or the plaintiff in the case we also have to see if the finding recorded against the appellant on certain issues are set aside then how can i still sustain the decree which is passed against the plaintiff the appellant therefore as an appellate counsel you have to have a holistic approach to the entire proceeding and not a piecemeal approach this is a very important aspect of advocacy in appellate courts now there is another important aspect of appellate advocacy the there is what is called as a doctrine of merger the appellate the trial court decree merges in the appellate court decree and therefore when we are arguing a second appeal before the high court whether you are arguing for the appellant or the respondent what is relevant is to look at the judgment of the lower appellate court because the judgment of the trial court has merged in the judgment of the lower appellate court and therefore our endeavor must be if you are appearing for the appellant to point out that the lower appellate court has committed an error in law and therefore warranting interference under section 100 of the code of civil procedure of course if you are appearing for the respondent you will say that the lower appellate court was right the focus therefore in a second appeal where there is the doctrine of merger which applies namely the judgment of the trial court merges with that of the appellate court the focus of the counsel arguing an appeal must or second appeal must be on the judgment of the lower appellate court we have to focus on that now having seen these broad issues arising out of advocacy in first appeals let us have a look at the art of advocacy in second appeals and as you are aware second appeal is always before the high court under section 100 of the code of civil procedure second appeal is only on what is called as a substantial question of law it is therefore important as advocates if you are appearing for the appellant to open the case by stating in a concise manner what in this view of the counsel what in our view is the question of law which arises and i would advise and that's how i have adopted as part of my advocacy in in the appellate court especially in the high court when we are doing a second appeal is to first formulate the question of law the question of law should be so formulated that it will indicate to the court at immediately what is the broad framework of the suit and what is the grievance of the appellant against the order of the lower appellate court for example if we are arguing a suit arise if we are arguing an appeal arising out of a suit for possession and the defense taken is that the suit is barred by limitation 
or that the plaintiff has perfected his title by adverse possession the question of law should comprise of these words whether the plaintiff appellant has perfected his title to the suit scheduled property by applying the doctrine of adverse possession the moment you formulate the question of law in that way you have indicated to the court so many things first that this is also possession second the plaintiff is not claiming title third the focus should be on whether the plaintiff has been in adverse possession for the required period of time all these immediately strikes to the court and then you can point out how the plaintiff has established that he or she has been in possession of the suit scheduled property for the required period of time as required under the limitation act in order to perfect title by applying the doctrine of adverse possession that is that can happen only where as lawyers arguing the second appeal we focus our attention on formulating the question of law in a precise and proper manner as i indicated the question of law must at the outset strike to the judge the point in issue let us assume that we are in second appeal against a money decree arising out of a sale transaction the question of law should indicate whether and if the suit of the plaintiff has been dismissed and the plaintiff is in second appeal before the high court this question of law must say whether the lower appellate court was right in rejecting the claim of the plaintiff for the payment of rupees so and so arising out of a sale transaction of so and so having regard to section so and so of the sale of goods act all these if you formulate the question in this way the court at least will get an idea as to what the case is about is it a money decree is it a property suit dispute is it a title case is it an injunction suit or is it a specific performance suit so the formulation of the question of law by the counsel independent of how it is formulated in the appeal memo appeal memo has to state the questions of law that's a different issue i am now focusing on what are the things that a advocate should do as part of his oral submissions before the appellate court because a even if the question of law has been formulated in a particular way in the appeal memo in the course of your arguments a counsel can always say well the question of law requires to be refined i would rather formulate it this way and then pass it on to the judge and then say please reframe the question of law and the court can do it court has on the power to reframe the question of law in a second appeal therefore the question of law that is raised in a second appeal has to be very precise and comprehensive it should not give a feeling to the judge that you are trying to reargue the case on facts in fact if the question of law can even set out based on admitted finding or admitted fact that so and so so and so happened whether the lower appellate court was right in confirming the decree of the trial court or reversing the decree of the trial court having regard to section so and so of the so and so act that will completely give a picture to the judge in the high court who is hearing the second appeal as to what the case is all about and then the responsibility of the lawyer arguing the second appeal is more onerous than the responsibility of a lawyer who is arguing the first appeal it is important that we do not question the findings pure findings of facts which have been recorded by the lower appellate court 
or recorded by the trial court and affirmed by the lower appellate court that is going to take us nowhere in a second appeal it is therefore important that when we are arguing a second appeal before the high court we have to point out one of the following defects in the judgment and decree of the lower appellate court if we are arguing for the appellant namely one that there is a omission to take into account a important piece of evidence be it oral or documentary if that evidence had been taken into account the conclusion of the court would have been different that is point number 1 not on whether pw1 should be believed or pw2 should be believed or dw1 should be believed over pw1 that is not the role of a second appellate court under section 100 omission to take into account a relevant piece of evidence be it oral or documentary is a question of law is in fact a substantial question of law which can be gone into in an appeal under section 100 therefore our focus as lawyers arguing a second appeal should be to find out which evidence has been omitted to be taken into account and project that as the main point in our case the second point on which we can argue a substantial question of law is where the lower appellate court whether affirming the decree of the trial court or reversing the decree of the trial uh, trial court and we are arguing for the appellant is to point out an error in law namely to find out that the interpretation that is placed by the court on a particular document is wrong an interpretation of a document is a question of law if the court on the basis of certain agreement clauses in an agreement come to a particular conclusion and that conclusion can be shown to be wrong then interpretation of a document can be a question of law in some cases so we have to focus on that third of course which we all know is to look at the statutory provisions as interpreted by the courts and then say this interpretation has not been properly adopted by the lower appellate court while passing the judgment and decree which is appealed against if we do this then we would definitely have got the attention of the court as to whether the court will agree with us or not agree with us is a different issue we are not concerned with that as lawyers we are now concerned with how i can make the best presentation before the court as a lawyer appearing in a second appeal whether for the appellant or for the respondent and of course your job as a lawyer appearing for the respondent in a second appeal is to show that the lower appellate court has not committed any error and that there is no substantial question of law which arises in fact on this question of substantial question of law as to what is substantial question of law there is a very detailed judgment of the honorable supreme court in what is called as hero vinod versus shesham mal which is reported in 2006 volume 5 scc 545 and i would request all of you to look at the judgment and then you will see what is the true scope and meaning of these words substantial question of law as mentioned in section 100 of the code of civil procedure while we are at section 100 of the code of civil procedure it is also pertinent to look at section 101 of the code 101 in fact reiterates what has been stated in section 100 section 100 says that appeal is maintainable second appeal is maintainable on question substantial questions of law having said that section 101 goes further and says that no appeal shall lie except on the grounds mentioned in section 100 and if you will see section 100 the grounds on which an appeal shall lie a second appeal shall lie under section 100 to the high court is where there is a substantial 
question of law, the high court has to be satisfied that there is a substantial question of law. Now, when we are looking at oral advocacy in appellate courts, we have to look at it from two stages. One is where you are arguing a first appeal for admission, where you are arguing a second appeal for admission. A first appeal, when it comes up for admission, normally, as a matter of rule, the court admits the appeal, especially where the suit has been dismissed. Because the court will say, if anyway, this suit has been dismissed, we'll have a second look at it. Therefore, the amount of time that we should take as lawyers arguing a first appeal before an appellate court at the stage of admission should be very little compared to what we would take at the final hearing of an appeal. Therefore, the art of advocacy will change depending upon the stage at which we are called upon to argue the case. Am I uh, to appear at the stage of admission? Am I to appear at the stage of final hearing? Now, when you are appearing for the appellant in a first appeal, the challenge is less. But when we are appearing for the respondent in a first appeal, invariably, the attempt would be to get the appeal dismissed even without admission. That is a greater challenge because the court is always inclined to admit a first appeal, call for records, examine it in detail. While that may be the position, there is one crucial stage where a respondent's lawyer has a very important role to play even in the first appeal. That is when the plaintiff is seeking an interim order. Now, a plaintiff, let us assume, in a suit for specific performance, which has been dismissed, is seeking for an injunction to restrain the defendant respondent from alienating the property. An injunction order of that kind will have tremendous repercussion on the owner of the property, namely the defendant, because an appeal may take a couple of years until then the property is locked up. Therefore, at that point of time, the respondent's counsel has to be, has to formulate his or her submissions with a view to persuade the court saying, do not grant any injunction. And even if you have to grant any injunction of the kind, put the appellant on terms. This is a very delicate role which a respondent's lawyer has to play with a view to persuade the court not to grant an absolute stay in a property dispute. If an absolute stay is granted, it is likely to have serious repercussions on the rights of the respondent if the appeal ultimately is dismissed of five years. So therefore, we have to make it as difficult as possible for the appellant too, and not simply say, well, maintain status quo. It's a very easy order to pass. It's a very convenient order for the appellant plaintiff who has lost the suit for specific performance, but it is a most inconvenient order for a defendant respondent to suffer. Because an appeal, as I said, may take several years for disposal and the status quo with respect to the property will remain till then. Therefore, we have to ensure that it becomes very difficult for the appellant who has lost the case to block my property. And the court will be persuaded in such a situation to put the appellant on terms. And once the court proceeds to put the appellant on terms, like for example, you have to compensate the respondent for any damage that may be suffered by the respondent on account of this interim order. 
the appellant will then think twice should i really press for the interim order or should i leave it for the present and in any event if it's a immovable property we have provisions like section 52 of the tp act which we can press into service and the most important is in money decrease as you are aware the rule is that no stay must be granted in money decrease exception is stay even where stay is granted in a money decree against the defendant and the defendant is in appeal the court can insist and with the normally do for deposit deposit 50% of the money provide security for the remaining 50% these are orders that are passed on the basis of persuasive arguments of counsels that is really where advocacy comes to play a important role because the law book simply says well if the court is satisfied that there is a sufficient cause for stay the court will see security for cause what is sufficient cause how do you say that in a money decree stay should not be granted why in this case money decree should stay should not be granted these are all aspects which one has to take into account and as part of oral advocacy in appellate courts it becomes very crucial now there is another challenge that the respondent in an appeal will face in a money decree let us assume for the sake of argument that the court says all right 50% to be deposited by the appellant defendant now that money will lie in the court of course our client as respondent in the appeal who has succeeded as plaintiff in the suit in a money decree will want to withdraw the money now at that point of time one of the important aspects that will come up before the court and which will have a bearing on the decision of the court as to whether the money which has been deposited in the court should be allowed to be withdrawn by the respondent is what happens if ultimately the appeal is allowed will the respondent refund the entire money with interest and in order to assure that the money will be refunded with interest to the appellant in the event of the appeal being allowed as part of restitution proceedings will the respondent furnish a security for the money that is withdrawn by the respondent it's a hard decision to make and that of course is entirely left to the respondent because it's a commercial call but this is an important aspect that we as lawyers have to keep in mind because this is the first question that will be put to us by the court mr counsel what happens if this appeal is allowed is your client willing to furnish a bank guarantee i mean instead of going to court and then this is not a surprise question this is a question that comes regularly in courts therefore it is important as advocates that we prepare ourselves in advance discuss these aspects with our clients and then say what's your view are you willing to furnish security are you do you really want to withdraw this money or do you are you better off by this money being in court and put in a deposit and ultimately if you succeed you will get the money with the uh, interest and if you lose the case the money will be taken back by the appellant plaint by the appellant defendant these are important decisions to be made at discussions before the hearing as part of preparing for oral advocacy this is a very crucial stage of a appeal proceeding now when we come to arguing an appeal at the final stage one important provision that we normally use is order 41 rule 27 of the code of civil procedure namely where we want to add on some evidence which has not been put before the court 
which is which has tried this route and we want to now get that additional evidence before the court applications for letting in additional evidence is not allowed as a matter of course one has to make out a case as to why this particular evidence was not adduced before the trial court we have to show that that document was not available in spite of diligence or it is a subsequent event that we want to bring to the notice of the court these are aspects which a appellate court lawyer has to keep in mind and additional evidence under order 41 rule 27 is not an uncommon feature it is a common feature in almost every appeal you will find that there is an attempt to introduce additional evidence now as councils who are opposing the introduction of additional evidence we have to ensure that the evidence that is sought to be adduced is not allowed as a matter of course we have to show that this evidence was within the knowledge or capability of the other party to produce in the trial court and they have willfully not produced it and therefore the additional evidence should not be given now there is a tendency on the part of the at least the appellant to somehow get the decree set aside and have the case remanded to the trial court this would be beneficial to the appellant especially if a suit is decreed and the appellant wants to get the decree set aside and have it remanded to the trial court or the plaintiff has lost the case and the plaintiff is in appeal and the plaintiff somehow wants to have a second innings this second innings concept which is also becoming outdated even in the game of cricket should not be allowed in litigation that is why there are provisions in the cpc which provide that the appellate court itself can decide all questions if all the evidence is there without remanding it in fact even where there is some evidence which is lacking on a particular issue the law provides that the appellate court can say i will retain this case with me i will simply ask the trial court to record a finding on a particular issue and send it to me instead of remanding the entire case that should be if the court is inclined to do any of those things like remand or quasi remand as i call it counsel arguing must keep in mind to ensure that the decree is not set aside the decree remains intact call for a finding what what is the effect of the finding that may be recorded by the trial court on a particular additional issue that may be framed by the appellate court is a different matter we will argue it at the final stage but as lawyers we have to consciously oppose any attempt on the part of the appellant to get the matter remanded in fact remand according to me is agonizing so far as the respondent is concerned in an appeal because it will prolong the litigation and one more round of appeal after a, a, a judgment is passed after remand and when is the litigation going to end therefore as a matter of strategy as councils arguing an appeal we should ensure that a remand is not allowed whatever has to be done let it be finished in this round should be our objective and let me tell you the law supports it supreme court has time and again said remand should not be allowed as a matter of practice remand is an extraordinary order to be passed and we should the appellate court should decide the case instead of simply passing the buck back to the trial we as lawyers should take advantage of that position and ensure that a case is not remanded it may be good 
for one party to have the case remanded because it is delay but for a party who has succeeded especially where we are arguing for the respondent in an appeal remand is not a good proposition and is not in the interest of a respondent and in this situation therefore we have to strategize as to how we can avoid prolonging the litigation this is an important aspect of a first appeal now there is one very important aspect that we need to take note of while arguing a appeal there may be several orders on interlocutory applications that might have been passed by the trial court in respect of which we might not have appeal for example we file an application before the trial court for framing of an additional issue let us assume for the sake of argument that the trial court has rejected that application and the order on that application has remained unchallenged ultimately the suit is decreed in favor of the plaintiff defendant files an appeal and in that appeal the defendant is entitled to say i had filed an application before the trial court for recasting the issues or for raising an additional issue the trial court dismissed my application that dismissal order is wrong now if that dismissal is wrong order is wrong then the decree also passed against me is wrong that is a very important aspect of arguing an appeal whether it is before the first appellate court or before the second appellate court the question is an or an order in a proceeding which has not been challenged can be found fault with in an appeal against the final decree that is the law on the point these are all the nuances of an appeal which as advocates we ought to keep in mind because it is on that basis that we will be able to structure our argument now that we have seen the scope of appeals under section 96 and section 100 there is one very important aspect of appellate jurisdiction that we need to look at and we lawyers come across this very frequently those are appeals under section 104 of the code of civil procedure a application in a, and we all know that many suits are contested more feverishly and with greater vigor at the interlocutory stage than at the final stage in fact in many cases if the plaintiff does not get an injunction he will lose interest in the case in many cases when the plaintiff has got an injunction the defendant will lose interest in the case and this is very much so when we do ip matters if there is an injunction restraining the use of a mark by the defendant the defendant will say i am not going to fight this case it's a waste of time i will go change my mark and carry on my business if the plaintiff does not get an order of injunction the plaintiff will say it's not worthwhile i am not going to fight this case i might as well uh, do something else that because the defendant will build up the market by then now in its therefore appeals against orders becomes very important whether it is a temporary injunction order or whether it is any other order as provided for under order 43 which is appealable especially temporary injunction orders whether it is granted or refused now the scope of an appeal under section 104 read with order 43 is very different from an appeal under section 96 first principle for an appeal under 104 which we all as arguing councils have to keep in mind is that an appeal under section 104 read with order 43 is an appeal on a principle of law antox case is a leading judgment vander versus antox is a leading judgment on the point 
it is an appeal on a principle of law is what does that mean what does that statement mean and if we understand that statement then we will be able to structure our argument in an appeal arising out of an order filed under section 104 read with order 43 if two views are possible on a particular set of facts and the trial court has taken a particular view then the appellate court will not interfere with such an order even if the appellate court feels that if i were sitting as a trial court i would hold in the opposite direction in other words the jurisdiction of the appellate court to interfere with the discretion that has been exercised by the trial court while granting or refusing to grant an interim order will not be interfered with unless the appellate court comes to the conclusion that there is a manifest error of law that has been committed by the trial court or that the order passed by the trial court is perverse or that the order passed by the trial court proceeds on incorrect principles of law the scope therefore is very limited even though in 104 you don't use you don't find the words like substantial question of law or question of law none of those things are there still the judgment law is that the appellate court will not interfere in appeals against orders passed by the against interlocutory orders passed by the trial court as a matter of course if two views are possible the appellate court will defer to the view taken by the trial court even if the appellate court judge feels oh on these facts i think i would have taken a different view well maybe the appellate court would have taken a different view if the appellate court the trial court but the law is that the appellate court will respect the discretion exercised by the lawyer lawyer trial court having said that therefore we as lawyers arguing an appeal under section 104 have to focus our attention in a different manner than when we are arguing in appeal under section 96 we have to show that the view taken by the trial court either while granting the injunction or refusing to grant the injunction is so perverse that nobody reasonably would have come to that conclusion either because the conclusion is perverse or there is a manifest error or that the order of the trial court suffers from an error of law this is the meaning of the statement contained in vander versus antox when you say that an appeal under 104 is an appeal on a matter of principle it is not an appeal in the sense of having a relook at the entire case now that we have seen appeals under the cpc first appeal second appeal appeal against orders having regard to tribunalization we now have appeals from the original tribunal like for example the national company law tribunal appeal lies to the national company law appellate tribunal from an order passed by the national company law appellate tribunal appeal lies to the honorable supreme court now at each of these stages in the first appeal and the second appeal for example under the electricity act there is an appeal provided to the aptel appellate authority uh, appellate authority for uh, electricity against an order passed by the electricity regulatory commission against the order of the aptel there is a direct appeal to supreme court for example there are appeals provided from tri telegraph authority of india to tdsat tdsat appeal directly to supreme court or for example from the excise tribunal 
the customs excise the segat or sistat as it then was appeal lies to the supreme court now in all this it is important for us to examine each statute to find out whether this what is the scope of appeal for example if it is an appeal from the order passed by the nclt to the nclat appeal is on a question of law it is not on a question of fact and then they don't use the word substantial question of law they simply use the word question of law so now we have to understand what is the meaning of substantial question of law as opposed to question of law and then structure our argument before the appellate tribunal in a manner so as to bring our case within the contours of the appellate provision contained in those special enactments therefore when we as lawyers are arguing an appeal from a tribunal to an appellate tribunal we have to examine carefully the provisions of the relevant statute to find out the scope of the appellate tribunal and to what extent can the appellate tribunal interfere with the orders passed by the original tribunal and then there is a further appeal to the honorable supreme court because there is a difference now when you file an appeal to the supreme court against an order that is passed by the high court in appeal or by the high court in second appeal you file it as under section 109 of the code of civil procedure read with article 136 the entire the way in which the entire proceedings are looked at is so different from a statutory appeal for example from an order that is passed by the national consumer redressal commission as you are aware if the amount of claim is more than a particular amount i think it is a crore of rupees or something like that a crore or more original complaint lies with the national consumer dispute redressal commission against an order passed by the national commission appeal lies to supreme court that becomes a first appeal to supreme court there the supreme court can go into even questions of fact because it is a first appeal but if it is an appeal from say company law tribunal to the appellate tribunal and from the appellate tribunal to the honorable supreme court the scope of appeal is different therefore we have to see what are the relevant provisions of the statute under which appeals are provided for and on that basis we have to structure it this is a very new angle for appellate court appellate lawyers because you are not arguing a matter in a court you are arguing a matter before the tribunal and now i want to place before you one aspect which is not mentioned in any law but which we as lawyers experience in most of the appellate tribunals you will find there is a judicial member and there is a technical member too much of legality before these tribunals whether even before an appellate tribunal will not give us the desired result what is important is to show to them that in law on the basis of facts there is an error mere law which may appeal in a court presided over by an experienced judge may not cut eyes in an appellate tribunal because appellate tribunal is always looking at advancing the object of the particular statute under which the appellate tribunal is working therefore if we advance an argument which will either curtail their rights or in any manner thwart the object which is sought to be achieved then we will find that the appellate tribunals will normally not be received therefore as lawyers it will be useful if we structure our submissions in a manner which will advance the object of the statute so as to persuade the appellate tribunal functioning under that statute to hold in our favor
Ladies and gentlemen, I think I have given you a bird's eye view of what has to be done by a lawyer arguing an appeal in various situations. And of course, each case is different. Each lawyer is different. And most importantly, structure your advocacy depending upon the bench. There are judges who are technical. There are judges who are equity prone. There are judges who look only at law. There are judges who look only at facts. Therefore, it is important that we study the judge. In fact, I want to end by pointing out, by sharing with you one experience I had at the initial stages of my practice. I had briefed Mr. Soli Sarabji in a matter for appearing before the High Court. He had, our matter was at item number 60 or something like that. So I told Mr. Sarabji, sir, you need not come to court at 10.30. I shall send word to you when the court reaches item number 40, because you can reach from the hotel to the High Court in a matter of 10 minutes. And do you know what Mr. Sarabji told me? That is a very important tip for all advocates. Whether you're arguing in an original side or you're arguing in an appellate side, more importantly in appellate side. He said, no, I don't know this judge. I will be in court at 10.30. I will sit in the court because I want to observe this judge. And depending upon his approach to a case, is he a technical judge? Is he an equity prone judge? Is he a fact prone judge? Is he a law prone judge? Is he a patient judge? Is he an impatient judge? I will then structure my argument. And he came at 10.30 and waited till 12.30 when the case was taken up. He watched the court for two full hours. And a man of his experience, who must have appeared before hundreds of judges of different temperaments. This was a very good lesson that I learned from him to understand that a good lawyer arguing a matter, especially in the appellate court, to structure his arguments depending upon the type of judge before whom he is appearing. And of course, you all know that we have acquittal judges, we have conviction judges, and we have to see how to capitalize on the attitude and approach of a particular judge. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. I enjoyed going through all these provisions and I hope it was useful and it will be useful to all of you, especially the younger members of the bar. Thank you. And I'm very grateful to the organizers. I am grateful to Vikas. I'm grateful to Trivikram for giving me this opportunity. So the bird eye view actually, as they say that once it's a bird eye view, you carry a 3D image. They say once you're a normal human being, you only just watch straight line and the up lines. Whilst you, it's a bird eye view, carry the third dimension view. And same was yours in a capsule of around 70 minutes on the trot. It was all not only substantial question of law, but we understood substantially as to how could be the oral advocacy be done. I'll ask Vikram to share his thoughts and then we will take any questions if it is there. And I can share that I was just looking at the YouTube. It is one of the fastest growing sessions on our platform, though we have been uh, done around 500 sessions so far. Over to you, Trivikram. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Trivikram. Good evening. An extremely academically enriching session, sir. You have brought out the nuances and the intricacies very well and uh, very exhaustive. I don't think it was just a bird's eye view. In fact, a very exhaustive and a very informative session, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm grateful to you. Yeah. Thank you, friends. Stay connected with us. Tomorrow at 6 p.m., we will have Justice Hari Prashad speaking upon the nuances to be learned for the criminal appeal. He's a former director of Kerala Judicial Academy. Thank you, friends. Stay safe, stay blessed. And as they say, it's a new year. And to begin the new year with the good insights from a person of the immense knowledge of Mr. K.G. Raghavan. As they say, well begun is half done. So we believe that this year would always be a good enriching session for everyone to all follow up. Thank you. Stay Thank safe. you. And wish you all.